Hi, everyone. Welcome to another exciting episode of the AfricanMusicLaw.com show. From sunny California, USA, it's your one and only certified game changer, Miss Uruak. Right now, it's really, 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 really hot here in California. I mean, as high as 107 degrees, 104 degrees. It's super hot. So while it's sunny California, it's very hot. I can't even emphasize how hot it is. So be sure to stay cool out there. I'm a fashion and entertainment lawyer with the law firm of AB2 Law Group PC. And you're listening to the AfricanMusicLaw.com show, a show that is about the business of empowering the African artists and other creative talents in the fashion and entertainment industry, both here in the USA and across the African continent. If you are new to the show, here's how we do it. We take on the latest in celebrity legal drama, music business, and industry news, and we essentially provide legal and business commentary and analysis on this very, very hot topic in pop culture. And what you see is literally the intersection of pop culture and the law, and many times pop culture colliding with the law. We also invite our industry experts, artists, and other cool people, people we call AML people, so African Music Law abbreviated, and they come on the show to share their insights with us in hopes that it benefits you all. If you would like to stay updated on when we publish our weekly podcast, please be sure to subscribe directly on the website www.africanmusiclaw.com. We're also now on iTunes and Stitcher Radio, so please be sure to subscribe through those mediums also, all of which you can access directly on the site at africanmusiclaw.com. You can also find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash African Music Law. You can find us on Twitter with the Twitter handle African Music Law. And if you'd want to follow me personally, Miss Uruak, the host, feel free to check me out on my Twitter handle. And that is at Uruak Law, Uruak Law, U-D-U-A-K-L-A-W, Uruak Law. Finally, if you'd like to sponsor the show or you are interested in appearing as a guest, please feel free to hit me up at africanmusiclaw at gmail.com. Either way, I'd love to hear from you. Okay, so before we really get started, quick question is, how are you doing? I always like to know how you're doing. Hopefully, your week was productive. I have to say one thing, and certainly all of you can relate to it, the constant waking up, especially as artists, creative talents, creative people, and business owners, because there are a lot of business owners that listen to the AfricanMusicLaw.com show. And the challenge to constantly stay focused on the game plan to, to make things happen, it certainly is a challenge, isn't it? You have to tell yourselves that you can do it. You have to tell yourselves that you see the end result and you have to push and push and push and push and push hard. So I want to encourage you as we get prepared to usher in the new week that you go hard, like go hard. I personally love to go very hard, especially when it comes to my career. You know, other aspects of my life, I go hard. I do have some areas that are not as hard as I could go. But the point is when it comes to business, I really like to go as hard as possible. So I encourage you to go hard and certainly on the mind, body and soul, keep working on going even harder than you already are. Today, we'll be talking about the Lecrae versus Katy Perry case. What I'd like to do is take a quick break. When we come back, I want to share with you my love and passion for Christian hip hop. And then I want to get into the analysis of this case. We're going to roll our sleeves. I actually did this podcast last week, and then I decided, you know what? I wasn't happy with it, and I was just going to go ahead and do a brand new one. And the reason was because Africa is really part of this this show. So I wanted to be able to do literally a parallel comparison of Nigerian you know, law and the U.S. law, whereas before it was more focused only on U.S. law. We do have a Nigerian who's litigant on the plaintiff side of this case. So at the minimum, I'd like a lot of you, a lot of you that are happen to be Nigerian listeners to also get a sense of how this would play out in your country, specifically Nigeria. So let's take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll do this from the point of view of the U.S. copyright law, as well as Nigerian copyright law. We'll be right back. You're listening to the AfricanMusicLaw.com show with your one and only certified game changer, Miss Uruak.
Welcome back, folks. Before we get really started, let me tell you my background on how I discovered Christian hip hop music and why, for me, it's particularly interesting when I hear or see the um, the statement by Lecrae and the other litigants in their complaint as quoted in a lot of news reports since I didn't get the actual copy of the complaint. But basically, the quote is as follows. And by any measure, the devoutly religious message of joyful noise has been irreparably tarnished by its association with the witchcraft, paganism, black magic, and Illuminati imagery evoked by the same music in Dark Horse. Indeed, the music video of Dark Horse generated widespread accusations of blasphemy and an online petition signed by more than 60,000 demanding removal of an offensive religious image from the video. I find it interesting to just lay the context because I think often when we talk about these things, whether you're looking at it from a fashion end of things where people are saying the West is inappropriately appropriating culture, whether through trademark infringement or copyright infringement issues, sometimes we really don't understand what the fuss is, but we're not part of that culture. I think it's quite unique when you're talking about the Christian community, Christian culture, and the whole emphasis on Christianity is, you know, trying to be perfect and holy as God is through his son that he sent on earth to die to save the world, that that would be Jesus. And then we know this interesting story from way back in the days that we've heard from Genesis all the way to Revelation in the Bible, this story that God created all things beautiful in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and the and, and, and the word was God, as I said before. And we understand that God created an angel and that angel was Lucifer. And the angel was beautiful with amazing kinds of talents that God gifted this angel, including the gift of music. And however, when Satan, Lucifer, was cast down on earth because of the rift he had with God. All of a sudden, Satan uses that particular gift, the gift of music, to turn everything against God, to turn humanity, to turn uh, God's people against God. So you have this gift of music, and you've got the Christian community, and specifically Lecrae, who's and his uh, Lecrae and his co-authors, because there are four of them who created this music. They create joyful noise to give glory to God in all purity and harmony and worship. And then you have the world, who typically doesn't even have any respect for Christian music, and for a while that was deserved because, as I'm going to explain to you, when I started to listen to Christian music, really the quality was terrible out there. And there weren't people really focused on the production quality, on the lyrical content, on the delivery, on the stage presence and everything that goes into producing music and performing it and marketing and promoting. A lot of the artists just felt like because I was a Christian, I can just slap some sounds together, say God or Jesus, and that's the end of things. You have a new crop of fellows who came in and said, no, we got to elevate this game. We got to bring everything to it and perform just as well, if not better. And all of a sudden, you've got circular world or the world generally that looks down on, on Christians that say they, they promote propaganda. And of course, there's a historical context of some of those things that may um, give valid reasons for sometimes why the world condemns Christians. But anyways, you have the world now basically infringing on their copyright. So it makes it quite interesting. And and that specific language I read you guys in the beginning was what caught my attention to say, you know what, I really want to talk about this because it allows me to fuse everything together. My love for law, my uh, interest in music. I I like music. I told you guys already, I studied music all throughout till college. Uh, I was actually initially a declared minor in music, but then switched to philosophy because I just could not do that long... (laughs) that long um, assignments where I was required to watch the symphony all the time and write about it. That was just not my idea of music. My idea of music was more hip hop and other pop music. And um, just to sit through that was torture for me back then. Now I appreciate that classical music in symphonies. But back then it was just like, oh my gosh. So let's go back to the beginning for me and how I discovered Christian hip hop and gospel, um, Christian hip hop music more so. And why uh, that particular line is is interesting 
for me and why we're discussing it today on the AfricanMusicLaw.com show because there's so many lessons and so many perils actually with uh, Nigeria's music industry. I was born in San Jose, California. I was raised in Lagos, Nigeria. Some few years back, I was in a panel speaking. Uh, I was invited to speak on a panel and one of my co-panelists um, was talking about generally you know, life and his experiences and stuff. And he made a comment that I'll never forget. And he said, you know, something about growing up with a wooden spoon in his mouth. And I just thought, you know what, that best describes it for me. So even though I was born in the U.S. and I was raised in Nigeria, I certainly was raised with a wooden spoon in my mouth. I, I, I grew up with uh, in a single parent home in the 80s. And you have to understand how remarkably different that is. First of all, I, I was living in a patriarchal society. And not only that, a, a society where women don't really have, not don't really, just simply don't have a voice. And now this is the 80s. And now it's, you know, trying to navigate that kind of world where a father is not around or a man is not around. That was very tough times for me. And uh, what I quickly discovered for me was that to protect myself and to protect my family and even to protect some of my friends, I needed to be very good with words. And I was pretty good, very gifted with words. So that's how I kept the bullies away. And that's how I uh, <laughs> wrecked havoc where it was necessary to do so. And um, I fell in love with words very deeply, much so. I learned how to speak by reading words off the billboard when my fam when I was in my family car or anywhere I was, it didn't matter. I was always engaging in my own personal spelling bee and spelling bees with others. Of course, I excelled in English courses, all, all other courses, but particularly English and writing, I enjoyed tremendously. And I was always journaling or scrapbooking. So I had such love for writing and words and at an early age considered myself a wordsmith before I even knew that indeed that's what I was and that I have a long legacy of people who in my family who are wordsmith. Come the 90s, just before I was getting ready to relocate back here, that's when hip hop music really hit Nigeria specifically. Now we were hearing MC Hama, we were hearing um, Marky Mark and a couple of other people in the 90s. And the sounds were very, very interesting to me. I really gravitated to it because it felt like there were people out there and a sound out there that seemed to understand the world that I grew up in. It just really deeply connected with me. Uh, the challenges, economic challenges, physical challenges, among other things, um, in a world that was just never friendly, very friendly to the girl child, and certainly not friendly to um, being raised by a single mother. So really, 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 really resonated with, with hip hop music. But one thing I really quickly discovered when I relocated back to the U.S. was that, you know, MC Hammer was talking about you got to pray just to make it a day, too legit to quit, you know, just very hyped up, happy, positive. And then other hip hop greats that that came before and after him were also really had a story to tell. There was a storytelling to it. It was a story of identity, who the black male was, the black people were, their identities, their struggles, how they were overcoming it, and what was next in line, and, and the way they were overcoming it. But something started to change. The music no longer became about that. The music started to become about the marginalization of women, the the just downright disrespect of the black woman, of the African woman, as I say, because we're all black people. Some of my black people sometimes say, hey, I ain't African. Yes, you are. Deal with it. But the point is, it was just a lot of very negative talks about who black people were, and even more so the black woman. And that really bothered me. And of course, as you guys know, it's gotten worse over the years. It just seemed like you could put a bid on anything and just say anything terribly horrible. And and the black community internalized it. And of course, we lived that reality because when you look at our communities here in the U.S., it's just terrible what is happening in our communities. I don't need to bore you all with the common statistics or statements. You already know what all that is. But what that did for me was internally create a desire to find music because I wasn't going to abandon hip hop music. I was in love and the love was real deep. So there was no way I was going to give that up. 
And you also have to understand that context too, because back then, now hip hop music is everywhere. Corporate companies use them um, everywhere you go. You got to hear some sort of hip hop music somewhere. But back then, white America wasn't even embracing hip hop music, as we all know historically. So I would be that person who stood out, both in the African community, both in the white community, um, where there would, and even black community, depending on the circles, where they're like, okay, what's your choice of music? And just in regular conversations and in in business settings or whatever and i would say hip-hop music and people just would always look at me like i was crazy but i'm someone where i don't move on things just to move on things i move on things based on my own personal convictions and so whether people roll with me or not i'm gonna do what i'm gonna do for uduak it just is what it is Uh, what a family knows that close friends know that Everyone that meets me and just spends a little time with me just can immediately tell. So it did not matter to me how people viewed me or opportunities that I may have missed as a result of saying, here's what I'm about. Maybe parties I wasn't invited to or so it just did not matter. This is what I am. I'm not going to edit myself to accommodate your idea or your perspective of who I ought to be. So I am fully embraced that music. I can't tell you how many times my mom and the rest of my family members would scream to just turn that music down. Please, please, please. Certainly when they entered my vehicle, I I just had to always switch it off because otherwise my ear would be chewed out about listening to that music, blah, 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 blah. So... I kept looking for something. I was like, okay, I can't continue with this. I found underground hip hop music, but it still didn't do anything for me. You know, you can be in a struggle for a long time. That's all good and dandy. But at some point, you got to get past the struggle. You got to overcome the struggle because life is not meant to stay in a static place where you're constantly struggling. It's supposed to grow and overcome and move on and create situations where those behind you don't struggle the way you did. So I sought music that's that, was meant to elevate my mind, elevate my, my heart, and just push me to the next level. In researching on my own personal time, looking everywhere for the right music, hip-hop music that was positive, on my own, I found Christian hip-hop music. Christian hip-hop was still a very anomaly. Lecrae has a new album coming up uh, called Anomaly. Christian music was exactly, hip-hop music was, was exactly that. In the 90s, into the uh, 2000s, it was certainly that. And particularly when I really caught on in the early 2000s, it really, really was that. What was happening was um, you would I would listen to some of the Christian music radio and it never, never connected with me. Never at all. Because it was this like very specific demographic they were appealing to and nothing about it appealed to me at all. And I would wonder all the time, I know gospel music is just a big deal in the black community and a big deal globally. How come gospel music is not even on those regular Christian channels? Even till today, all these years, it's very rare to hear gospel music on that. When I wanted to hear gospel music, I had to switch on to my Bay Area um my Bay Area channel at the time, 106 KMEL, with the whole Chewy Gomez crew, etc. So that's where on Sundays in the morning, certain time, they would play gospel music. I think they also, KBLX also played it a couple of times uh, on Sundays. But beyond that, I couldn't find anything. And I wasn't really at the time, definitely not as much into gospel. Now I could roll with gospel, but it just was not my thing. Hip hop was my thing and I wanted something that was positive. So I found Christian hip hop music and went to, I remember going that first time to a Christian bookstore and asking if they had that and was just pleasantly surprised that they had a little section of their store with Christian hip hop music. At that point, I started to, uh, I bought, I think I must have bought 10 CDs that day. I bought everything I could find, all different artists. I just wanted to hear and see the variety. The result, frankly speaking, was terrible. The quality of music was not that good at all. But there were a few that were, okay, yeah, I could dig dig it, but overall nothing impressive. In subsequent times of coming and checking things out, I later discovered uh, Holy Culture, The Truth, who was part of Holy Culture, and my my favorite discovery at the time, I also discovered BBJ, who sounded more like Biggie at the time. 
And then I discovered KJ52, who people said sounded like Eminem at the time too. But what I really, really resonated with were two things, Holy Culture and um, KJ52. KJ52, because he went deep. I still remember one of his uh, mu- uh, songs titled KJ52 of his album that I bought. One of the tracks there was Guilty, and it had a whole court scene and stuff. It was just tight. I, I, I really enjoyed that. So... For a while, I continued to buy and purchase and check out music, Christian hip hop. But at some point, I lost interest in fully pursuing it because the quality wasn't good. A lot of uh, Christian artists just felt that because they were Christian artists, that was it. They didn't they were not required to um, put in the work. That's like me saying, because I'm a lawyer and a lawyer who believes in God, uh, I can just say, okay, Jesus, and then a lawyer, and that's a, supposed to, to make things happen. I still have to invest in my craft. I still have to invest in, in making sure I'm on to, I still have to make sure I'm on point and even have to make sure that I excel in all levels because God has given me the ability to excel. And I know that he's the one who gives wisdom, but wisdom is not to sit. You got to also put in the work. So I felt that a lot of this artist just did not really put in the work and investment in themselves to be better. At some point, the desire again resurrected and I still wanted music that would allow me to just be, just flow. Um, And I also wanted flexibility in Christian hip hop music because a lot of it was always about the Bible, which is fine. Holy culture was a lot of that. But there was nothing that talked about just regular everyday living. I mean, yeah, you can talk about the Bible all the time, but you still got to step into the world and leave the practical aspect of it. And your life reflects all those challenges that you experience every day. How do you deal with those things from love relationships to business to, you know, everything else and just life in general? The word is good, but what's the practical application in real life of current 21st century situations? And is everything always about, as uh, the truth says, I ain't got no horror story. God kept me. That's my testimony. From one of his tracks and one of his albums, it talks about how he doesn't have all these crazy things. And a lot of what I would hear in uh, in Christian hip hop music was a lot of that. You know, I used to be in a terrible situation and God saved me. Well, that's not necessarily all my story. There's, uh, there's a bunch of that, but the, you know, that's not my complete story. So anyways, fast forward, continuing to look for and hope for, I ultimately discovered a new class of Christian hip hop musicians. And this ones were very, very serious about the business of God and the business of music and enter Lecrae and all the 116 click and all the other crew out there that are just making things happen across the board. Uh, Derek Minor, uh, Propaganda, uh, still KJ52 still on his thing and even gotten better and better and so many 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 other dynamic quality artists and of course the love stayed the same when I started the African Music Law in 2011 I of course started to share their music because I'm not going to talk about Africa and not talk about you know uh, Christian hip-hop that's just as close to me as Africa and, and law and all the other things that I'm interested in so that's my background And why I was particularly interested in this case, because it's a combination of everything that I'm interested in talking about and that I share with you guys. I'm also and was specifically also interested in this because, again, like I said, you've got a plaintiff here that's not just saying we've got an infringement lawsuit, but they're also saying you've really, really affected it really, really affected our reputation because you are taking something that's pure and turning it into something that's evil so to speak and the evil really affects us because culturally we don't affiliate with something like that because we are you know on the god path so that's interesting when we talk about damages we'll see how that plays out let's take a quick break let's come back and then let's get into more of the analysis and the legal analysis on the copyright infringement we'll look at what copyright law means we'll look at the infringement aspect of it and how you show infringement and then we'll wrap it up with our discussion on damages you're listening to the africanmusiclaw.com show with miss uruak we'll be right back Okay, so let's start first with the facts of this case. 
Anytime a case, a lawsuit shows up, whether we're talking here virtually uh, for AML or we're talking about what actually happens in my real world of litigation or any other lawyers, trial lawyers particularly, the facts are what help us identify the legal issues that we must go to battle on. So let's talk about the facts here. The facts of this case is we've got four litigants on the plaintiff side. They are Flame whose birth name is Marcus Gray. We've got Lecrae Moore, also known as Lecrae, Emmanuel Lambert, and Chike Ojuku. I don't know if Chike Ojuku is affiliated with the Ojuku family back in uh, Nigeria. But anyways, th- all four have sued Katy Perry. And actually, not just Katy Perry, they've sued Capitol Records, Jordan Houston, probably known as Juicy J, and a couple of other defendants in federal court. And what they're alleging is that there is copyright infringement of their work. Specifically, they say, the defendants that I just mentioned, so Katy Perry and co, have essentially taken their song, Joyful Noise, which was released five years before Dark Horse, and have basically had unauthorized reproduction, distribution, and public performance of plaintiff's musical composition, which constitutes infringement. And the reason why it constitutes infringement is they're claiming that they, the plaintiffs, have exclusive rights in their copyright. That's the central gist. And then they talk about this whole paganism stuff that I discussed prior to us going on a break. Artists, okay, this is where you really get your pens and papers and get to writing. So the first place we start is to ask ourselves, what is a copyright? The plaintiffs here are claiming copyright infringement, so necessarily we need to understand what copyright means. Copyright simply means the right to copy. That's it. The right to copy. So Copyright Act of 1976 is what I'm referencing here for for folks here in the in the US. Under that law, it's all about the authors. We value innovation. We value intellectual property. We want our society to grow. And so we're going to protect and reward people who take the time to help our society grow through their intellectual property. And here's how we're going to do that. If you create something and it is fixed, the language that's used is it's fixed in a tangible medium of expression. If you do that, we're going to protect you. We're going to sort of give you like a mini monopoly, if you want to call it that. And we're going to say the right that we've given you is exclusive to you and you can do whatever you please with it. So when I talked about that whole fix in a tangible medium of expression, you should be saying, what does that mean? In English, the podcast that I've just created is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So now you can download it, MP3, WAV file. My entire blog, the African Music Law blog, is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. You can go there and see all those writings that I've done. It's created and it's published. It's fixed. Lecrae's music, Joyful Noise, and everyone else that was a part of that track, they've created copyright that is fixed, tangible medium of expression. What does Nigeria's Copyright Act say? Nigeria's Copyright Act, while it doesn't use the same language of fixed in a tangible medium of expression, in the case of a musical work in Nigeria, there must be a showing of what is called a sufficient effort on the work to give it an original character and assuring that the work has been fixed in any definite medium of expression. So sort of like a play on the U.S. fixed in a tangible medium of expression, but they all mean the same. You created your music, you created your film, you created your book, you created your blog, you created your podcast or your mp3 for your podcast. It's all fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So let's go back. So we know Nigerian federal copyright law. We know the U.S. copyright law all on the same page that creative people who take the time out to create work, not ideas. Ideas are not protected people. So if it stays in your head, it stays in your head. So you've created this copyright work and the law has said, guess what? Because you've created a copyright work, we're going to reward you. What is this reward that you get? This mini monopoly that I was talking about that's given to you. 
in the U.S. and in Nigeria as well. Very parallel rights. Here is what you get. You have this exclusive right. No one else can take this right from you. To reproduce your work, so you can reproduce copies of your work. You can prepare derivative works of the copyrighted work. You can basically remix, do whatever you want to do with your work and create something else out of the original work that you created. You can distribute your copies of your work to the public through sale, transfer of ownership, rental, lease, or lending. You can perform your copyrighted work publicly. You can display the copyrighted, the, your copyrighted work publicly. So your music, you can display. Your literal arts, you can dis display. Your sculptural works, you can display. In the case of sound recordings, sound recordings, you can perform the work publicly by means of a digital audio transmission. So those are the rights that are given to you. That's exclusive copyright for you to do whatever you want to do with it. But like I always say, you can have all the copyright you want, but you're not just going to sit there and do nothing with it and say, ooh, I'm so smart. I'm so brilliant. I created music. Oh, I'm so smart. I'm so brilliant. I created a film. It's of no use if you can't make money off of it. So guess what you want to do? You want to license and get paid on it. When you license, you're giving up, but you retain the ownership rights in your work still. So your license is a permission, limited permission you give someone else to use your work. So for example, I rock in uh, Spinlet and the likes, they're not taking that total pie, that, that ownership right that you have. They're just saying, give me permission to make you a lot of money and make myself some money in the process too. You still retain your ownership, your copyright in the work. Or if you don't license, you can assign. Assign, you're given everything. You can do that. Unconditional, I don't want to deal with this. I created the work, I love it, but you take it forever and ever in eternity. That's one kind of assignment. If you're not assigning in that way, another way you can do it is you can assign and have certain years that you assign out and then have it revert back to you. So you can have a 30 years, I'm going to assign this, and then 30 years later, you're going to give that back to me. So that is the copyright that's created. So we know what a copyright is. We know the exclusive rights and we know what we can do now that we have this exclusive rights. And then we know that there are different ways to make our money. We can license or we can transfer through an assignment. So far, so good, everybody. You're, you're getting those notes down, artists. Okay, and here's why it was relevant, because remember when I told you guys in the factual pattern of what Lecrae and the fellow plaintiffs were saying, they said, hey, Katy Perry, Federal Copyright Act of 1976 says we own our copyright and it's exclusive. It says we're the authors. And it says also that, guess what? If you want to use it, you need to ask our permission and get our consent. Otherwise, we have this exclusive, exclusive rights to ourselves. And we can reproduce our work. We can prepare derivative work. We can distribute the copies. We can perform the copyrighted work. We can display the copyrighted work. In sound recordings, we can perform the work publicly by means of a digital audio transmission. Katy Perry, you didn't do any one of that. You just plain ripped our song off. Not only did you rip it off, it was unauthorized. Remember, reproduction, distribution, public performance of our musical composition. And that's infringement. You can't do that, homegirl. You can't. You need our permission. So... That is the basic framework. Now, there's so many different layers to this and so many issues that all of this raise. I talk about four litigants here. Lecrae, Flame, Emmanuel, Chike. Remember, if all four are suing, claiming rights into the song, remember the concept that I've talked about over and over again on the blog, and that's the concept of joint authors. So let me address that very briefly. When you create a work, with someone else, you are joint authors, both on the Nigerian law as well as uh, U.S. law, okay? There's a trick to it, though. It can be very messy if you don't sort out the percentage of who owns what. So under both laws, you want to make sure, artists, that if you go and you jump into the studio and you say, hey, we're going to create some, some music, some dope music right now, you best be sure that you sorted out who owns what. Because if you don't do that, then that creates an issue. It sounds like those fellas have all already figured all that out. 
So, you know, no issue on that end. Now, another significant point that I want to raise in the U.S., if you will sue for an infringement action, you must register your work. Let me repeat that again. If you were, first of all, you're not required both on the Nigerian and, and U.S. law to register your work typically. But under U.S. law, if you want to sue and bring an infringement action, you must register your work. A timely registration is usually within three months or even late registration is within five years of your published work. And all of that strengthens your case when others infringe or violate your copyright. If you register before your rights are infringed upon, you can recover up to $150,000 and possibly attorney fees when you sue per violation. And what's really sweet is you don't even have to prove actual monetary damages. So, you, so when you go into a court of law um, and you say, hey, someone's wronged you, then you say, hey, you know what? I was damaged. So basically they injured me and I incurred all this cost that I want to be compensated plus, you know, pain and suffering or any other punitive damages, you know, punitive means to punish. Well, in the case of copyright law, guess what? You don't have to prove your actual monetary damages. That's sweet. You just got to say, hey, someone violated my uh, copyright. And if you do that and can show that someone indeed violated your copyright, then you don't have to prove your actual monetary damages. Now, how do you show violation? Under U.S. law, you show violation through access and substantial similarity. So under the analysis, is there an argument that um, Katy Perry had access to, uh, to Lecrae's Joyful Noise? Absolutely. It's on the internet. It's everywhere. And it was published five years prior to her published work. So of course she had access. And the access analysis is, and prong is actually a lower threshold. So it's not that hard to prove access. Then you've got to show substantial similarity. Is the song substantially similar? Well, when you listen to the Joyful Noise and then you listen to Katy Perry's Dark Horse, the first thing that strikes you is that opening part. I'm going to have to play a little part of that Lecrae so you guys hear. So hold on a sec. Let's, let's listen to it. You know what it is. Let's talk about it. Your boy's been a Christian quite a few years. Victory and faith, but I failed in my fears. I heard a lot of words that have tickled many ears. That's why I praise God for the word that we adhere. The word became flesh, lived for 30 years. Died at 33, but after days reappeared. Jesus Christ anointed one ascended in the ear. Or you can say the air. Okay, so now you've heard it. Now, Katy Perry's song is global, so you've heard it over and over again. And when you listen to what I just played you, and you listen to Katy Perry's version on that opening track, you can hear that. So I just talked about, hey, you know what? I'll play and even played a sample of Lecrae's song. That takes us to a different question. You're probably thinking, Miss Uduak, you just talked about, hey, one needs permission to play someone else's work. How come you're playing Lecrae's, you know, a, a, a clip of Lecrae's song in your podcast? Did you get permission from him? No, I didn't. Well, how come you get to do that? Because while the Copyright Act has given a mini monopoly, if you will, to authors, Lecrae included, myself included, and everyone else, you the artist listening to this, you, the filmmakers listening to this and everyone else that's applicable under that definition. It's also clear that you're not going to hijack society with your intellectual property rights that you made. It's all good and dandy, but we ain't going to let you hijack society as a result of this intellectual property right that you've created. We think it's beautiful, but guess what? Miss Uruwa can get on, on a podcast show and criticize your work. Miss Uruwa can get 
on the podcast show and educate other people on what copyright really means. Miss Uduwa can get on a podcast show and talk about your music in a way that discusses more of a news reporting. So there are limitations to this Copyright Act. It's not, the right is not absolute. And the limitations is what is known as the fair use doctrine. Nigeria also has a very similar parallel law on fair use. Fair use doctrine simply says, I don't have to always get permission to use other people's work and neither do you. I don't have to get Lecrae's permission to use the the snippet that he just uh, that I just played that discusses the specific issue of whether an infringement existed. So long as that work is used for news, journalism, opinions, informational, educational purposes, criticism or research under what is known as the fair use doctrine, I can do so. Now, the fair use doctrine is actually quite dicey, nevertheless. Because there have been instances even in educational and informational and, you know, journalism and news where courts have still deemed the use to be to be actual commercial infringement of the copyrighted work. But generally, if you're talking about situations where the work is used for news, journalism, opinions, informational or educational purposes, criticism or research, then it is fair use. Is Katy Perry's use fair use here? Obviously not. She's making a lot of money off of it. But that's the court's decision to make. And that's for Katy Perry to assert, although I don't see her making that kind of assertion. But that could be a possibility. Or she could argue a concept called de minimis use, so barely used anything where it would be that significant. Remember when you had uh, Robin Thicke and uh, Pharrell Williams and the whole Marvin Gaye um, Blurred Lines lawsuit? That was sort of the, the argument they were making. We talked about that lawsuit on the blog. If it's fair use, if fair use can be made, the argument would be the court would look at, look at several factors, one of which is, hey, what's the purpose and character of this use? How much of it was actually used? Was a substantial portion of that use borrowed? And what is the effect of the use on the market for the copyrighted material? There are several layers to cover here, uh, but I want to keep it very simple. We'll come back and talk about other things. Notice here that I didn't talk about what is called a work made for hire and commissioned work. As this case goes along, we can we can move forward with it. Okay. So that's it. Now the final thing that we want to talk about are the damages. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back to talk damages. Listening to the AfricanMusicLaw.com show with your one and only certified game changer, Miss Uruak. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for listening and staying with me all the way till the end. AML artist, we are about done here. We're going to discuss damages, but let's do a quick recap. First things first was to talk about the facts. What really happened here? And I told you guys the facts are what permits us to know what the legal issues are in order to identify them and obviously take them head on and deal with them and address them in the courtroom. That's what you've got the plaintiff counsel and you've got the defendant's counsel all fighting about. And then the next thing we wanted to know was, well, well, what's the law? What does the law say? You've got plaintiffs claiming copyright infringement. What does the law say? In order to answer that, we looked at the definition of copyright. What is copyright law? Then we looked at the specific legal protections afforded you, the exclusive bundle of rights created by virtue of you, the author, having this copyright. Then we said, okay, great, you have this copyright, this exclusive copyright. What does that really mean? Are you going to sit there and keep staring at your exclusive copyrights? Or are you going to be about the business of music and making your money? So then we looked at the issue of licensing and transferring those rights through assignments. 
once we analyzed, understood that framework, it was time to start talking about when do people need to ask your permission in order to use your work and compensate you for it? And what happens if they don't? That got us to copyright infringement, which is exactly what Lecrae is claiming. And the litigants also attached to the Lecrae case, so the, the rest of the plaintiffs. We said this case was even more interesting because there was some cultural context that makes it quite interesting to look at. And this time around is from the Christian community and the Christian community saying, hey, you've taken something pure and holy that we've created and you've put basically blasphemy, dark, offensive religious images, among other things, and paganism and witchcraft to tarnish something holy and pure that we created. Very interesting, very different. And certainly makes for an exciting kind of lawsuit, depending on who counsel is on uh, on the case and how much they can push that. At the end of the day, regardless of what is said, a courtroom exists for one goal alone in the case of civil litigation. In the civil context is equitable remedies or monetary damages. So equitable remedies here, you've got Lecrae saying, hey, I want an injunction. Your Honor, make them stop. That's what injunction is. Make them stop doing what they're doing because it's hurting us. It's hurting our community. It's hurting our music. It's hurting our personal brand. It's hurting our professional brand. Make them stop. That takes us to the issue of damages when when he does that. So let's look at the specific damages that Lecrae wants. And then let's look at the damages that are offered both under Nigerian and U.S. uh, federal copyright law. Lecrae says, I want damages. So that's general damages, monetary damages. I want an injunction. Make them stop. And then I want defendant's profits gained from the unauthorized use of my song, Joyful Noise. Well, what does the Federal Copyright Act out of Nigeria say with respect to damages? In Nigeria, the federal copyright law will give you an injunction as well. It also has monetary damages. It also has accounting, which is essentially what Lecrae is asking for. And it takes it a step further, depending on the intent of the infringer. It calls it flagrancy under Nigerian law. So depending on the intent of the infringer, then the court will add damages that it deems appropriate. On the U.S. end, we call it willful. And just like the Nigerian end where the courts, the judges, they have the power to look at it and say, hey, we'll add extra damages if we deem it appropriate. The U.S. court also has a discretion here to do just exactly the same thing. Now, we take it a step further. So we've got the basically the overview of damages here and then the overview of damages in Nigeria. But let's narrow it down to the types of damages. So we know we have injunction, as I talked about, equitable remedies. So we've got injunction, make them stop. We've got the accounting part that Lecrae is asking for. So we got that down. Now let's focus and narrow in on the damages part. Damages in the U.S. is subdivided into two areas. You've got statutory damages and actual damages. Actual damages is exactly what it says it is. So can you prove specifically, can you show specifically the damage you suffered? So think of it as, let's say, a breach of contract case. Somebody said they were going to do something. They didn't do it. You paid them money for it. They ended up not showing up. What well, the actual damages you've suffered is that amount of money that they said they were going to, to do. They needed to do something that you paid them. And then they ended up not showing up to do the work. That's your actual damages. Statutory damages is different. It's set by law. So the law says regardless of how much you suffered, regardless of the actual damages that you suffer as a plaintiff, the range that you can win on the statutory damages is from $750 to $30,000 per infringement. And if it's a willful infringer, it can go up to $150,000 per infringement. So for the most part, needless to say, most plaintiffs opt for the statutory damage route. So then the question is, if they opt for that, how does the court then determine the damages that they have indeed suffered? The court looks at several things. It's going to look at the purpose of the infringing use. What we're using it for? Were you using that infringing work to create more piracy? Or were you buying it for your girlfriend or your boyfriend or like more personal as opposed to outright commercial infringing? So the court will look at the purpose of the infringing use. The court will also look at the value of the work that was infringed on. How much was it worth? 
How much did it cost? And then the court is going to look at the infringer's state of mind or intent. The statutory damages route is very powerful for the plaintiffs in copyright litigation matters. And, and so for those who are infringing, it's certainly something to think about and to be careful about. There are so many things to talk about, but even under the damages analysis, but I want to stop there. And here's what I'd advise that you do. If you are listening to this podcast, and it's exactly what you're going through as an artist or any persons in the creative industry, please contact your local lawyer, wherever you may be, your local entertainment lawyer. So for those in Africa, yes, there are a lot of lawyers around. Look for entertainment lawyers to help you out. For those here in the U.S., the same applies. Even more specifically, for me directly, if you're interested in following up with me on this particular podcast, here's how you can do it. Email me at africamusiclaw at gmail.com. You can email with your comments. You can email with your voice notes, MP3 or WAV file preferred. Be clear when you speak. Avoid all background noises because I may be interested in using it um, on our next podcast show. So be sure to send me voice um, notes with clarity that I can hear. The other thing is you can leave comments directly on the blog. I also ask for one simple favor. It takes a lot of time to put things like this together and I do it because I'm compelled to do it and to share this knowledge uh, to uplift and enhance and improve my own people and my own community. And all I ask is when you listen to it, Don't sit on it, share it with other people because they also need that enlightenment. The artist community and especially the creative community, both here in the U.S., lots of indie artists as well as overseas need this kind of information. So please don't be selfish. Share. I've shared with you. Pass on the love and share with other people. Until next time, it's your one and only certified game changer, Miss Uduak signing off. I'll catch you later. God bless. Cheers, my people. You know what it is. I love it. Uh. Yeah. I love Let's it. Let's talk about it. Your boy's been a Christian quite a few years. Victory and faith, but I failed in my fears.